Hi everyone, in this last Barbara Holland video, we're going to be talking about books. Uh, this will be much shorter than the last video that discussed the two essays, Cats and Buying Things. But uh, we'll just look at a couple of the uh, similar dynamics as we've been looking at the rhetorical approach and uh, structure to the rhetorical approach with transitions. And um, then we'll just also look at what books does a little bit differently than all the other essays we've read so far two maybe additional skills to think about incorporating into your own uh, in defense of essay. With that said, I haven't mentioned this before so explicitly, but the idea of reading Barbara Holland, the idea of looking at all six of these essays to identify how she structures them, develops them, how her claims are stated and developed, um, they're all models, are all possible models for you to imitate in your in defense of essay. Um, so you can think of your in defense of essay as an imitation of one particular Barbara Holland essay. For instance, if you think you have a topic that fits the rhetorical approach of naps, and you want to then structure your essay like naps and make similar type of claims that are true to your topic, of course, then go for it. Just to say outright, I'm going to imitate what Barbara Holland does in NAPS. I'm going to start with an anecdote that introduces the problem. I'm going to move to a problem making that identifies the audience, and then I'm going to transition into a solution that gives examples of why the audience should find my topic pleasurable. So if you want to do that, you can. Some of you might be taking um, multiple aspects or aspects from multiple essays and kind of combining them together. So I, you might say, oh, I'm starting off by taking a NAPS approach by using the anecdote, but then I'm moving into a trains approach with a comparison model of problem making instead of the NAPS uh, approach to problem making. So you just want to be thinking in terms of these skills, these elements that make up Barbara Holland's essays and what you might learn from them and incorporate in your own. So books will just add two more quick um, skills that you might want to think about and uh, we'll be done. But first let's look at the rhetorical um, approach to this essay and then the transition as well. So here we are. The document's now complete. I'll be sharing this with you. We have the approach in, sorry, books, the last essay. So the rhetorical approach in books says, in general, you might do this, but you do it for the wrong reasons because of social pressure. So that's very similar to um, the rhetorical approach in buying things. But books has a second rhetorical approach that combines with this first one. And that says, you don't do this enough because of social development. You should consider doing this the way you used to do it. Now let's talk about that in specifics and then turn uh, to the essay to make sense of it. Specifically, the rhetorical approach is you might like to read books, but you do it because you think it will make you smarter or give you some other practical benefit. You don't like to read books because you prefer to watch the movie version instead. You should consider reading books the way you did as a child. So new rhetorical approach, similar to buying things, but then it adds on uh, another element. And then the, the purpose, again, is slightly different. It sounds slightly different than the other ones. So how does she structure this with her transitions? Let's take a look at our second document we're working with. We have, last but not least, books. So on the first page of the essay, on page 172, third paragraph, um, after two paragraphs that introduce the topic and introduce the problem, she transitions into an argument that says, still there are books, other books, that will never lead to success, but that provide an odd, separate, impractical pleasure not offered by anything else on earth. And she goes on in that paragraph to start defining. So there's our first transition. Moves from the opening problem making into a solution. Later on page 174, 
after she has actually developed a solution for a little while. She says in the middle of the page, there's the movie, someone says. Why waste time with the book in the first place when we can rent the movie at the nearest video store and see the whole thing in a couple of hours without the effort of reading? So what she's actually doing here is transition away from the solution back to a new problem or a, a deeper level of the problem she started to address in the beginning. Immediately she starts to answer that um, with the next paragraph, well, yes and no, and she makes the argument. But really this is a transition back into a problem-making section uh, or introducing another problem that then allows her to solve that problem in a new way. So books is different than any of the essays we've read so far because it doesn't fully establish its problem then transition into a solution. It establishes a problem transitions into a solution, transitions back into a new problem, and transitions into a new solution. So it has a little bit of a different function. Now, you might think that you have a topic that can take this approach. And if you do, I want you to talk about it with me in your conferences or in office hours, because I think the default posture I want you to take is to fully develop a problem making first then transition into a solution. But of course there are variations. Your rhetorical situation might warrant a book's approach. Or like we talked about with cigarettes and cats, your topic might warrant a cigarettes or cats approach. But in those cases, you need to talk to me about how to do that well um, so that your essay is clearly organized and also has a clearly stated problem. So let's now turn to the text. And we're going to do this with you know, the actual book. I didn't have books photocopied like I did the rest of the essays. So I'm just going to have the book here, and you can follow along as you've been doing with your, the other videos as well. Just to point out uh, a couple additional things beyond the rhetorical approach and rhetorical structure, what she does that might help you develop an interesting claim or develop an interesting argument to solve the problem. So... There are two things I want to look at. Um, well, actually, there's just one main thing I want to look at, because the other was what we just addressed with the problem-making solution, problem-making structure. Uh, that is something that you might consider doing, but again, you need to talk to me. But one other thing I wanted to talk about in the solution section was a version of an anecdote that she uses in books that might be useful to you. And it also goes in particular to... Um, that rhetorical approach I mentioned, and specifically when she says, you should consider reading books as you did when you were a child. And this reference to childhood and what it was like to read in childhood is very interesting and actually forms part of her argument, a big part of it. So let's look at 173. So, nope, right here. 173. You see, in the bottom of 172, she transitions into her argument with, um, with actually what looks like a logical development um, transition, saying, still, there are books, other books. And then she goes on to define them. I don't mean noble ideas. Um, and she says it's a certain kind of book um, that she's recommending the reader read. But then in the... First full paragraph on 173, starting with the habit began in childhood, and then all the way down to the three paragraphs later, when she says, we got older and seized more control over our inner lives. Those three paragraphs make up what I'm going to call a shared anecdote. Anecdote is typically, as we know, a personal story, a story from the writer that is going to make a point about something. It's going to introduce or hint at the problem before the problem making has been fully established. The anecdote is going to be used as evidence to support a claim that's being made in the solution section. But typically, as we've seen with Holland, <clears throat> especially in buying things when she has 
multiple stories that develop about buying these certain objects that she was interested in. Um, they all have an I central to them. Here, we have a we. We got older, talking about children in third person, talking about childhood in general, some children, um, and so on. And so she's, she's moved out of the personal anecdote. And here's actually making an argument for the pleasure and joy of certain types of books, certain types that she defines in the paragraph before, by using a shared anecdote, a we anecdote. She basically has identified that her audience, she knows they had a similar past, that they once used to read books this way. She did, and so many other kids did. They used to read them and make believe and go into imaginary worlds and play books with their friends after they had read the books and became the characters of the books. And she knows that her audience had a similar experience. And she also knows that as that audience got older, they stopped doing that. They instead kept their focus on the practicalities of the world, the pressures of the world, responsibility, and they stopped imagining, they stopped dreaming, they stopped reading in this specific way. Knowing that, she wants them to not only remember the joy of reading, but what we call that as an emotional appeal would probably be a nostalgia asking the reader to remember the way it felt when they used to do it as a way to get them to reconsider doing it again. So those three paragraphs on 173 are what we call that shared anecdote. You might have the opportunity to do so if you have a topic that is something that was enjoyed in childhood by you, then you continued to enjoy it. Uh, that's why you're writing about it, but you see that many others didn't. You might consider this memory approach, this shared anecdote approach that, pardon me, that calls on your audience's ability to remember how they used to enjoy it. And you're just trying to convince them to enjoy it again. And one way you're doing that is connecting them to the feelings they once had. So this is an interesting approach. Many of you actually won't have a topic that fits into uh, that model. So you won't be able to use a shared anecdote because your topic wasn't once shared and enjoyed by your audience. You might though. And so you might want to consider uh, the shared anecdote. Technically, Naps um, could have had a shared anecdote. Remember the times we used to nap during preschool and nap after we played hard with our friends, right? She could have had a nice little shared anecdote in naps. Um, maybe not in any of the other essays. It might just be naps and books that had that possibility, but maybe your topic does. So like I said at the beginning of the video, imitate whatever you want from Barbara Holland, but always make sure that you're weighing it against your rhetorical situation, your rhetorical approach, what your topic is, and you learn from her the best you can and choose the skills or choose the approaches that best fit your writing situation. And I uh, can't wait to read these uh, essays and see what you come up with, see how you imitate Holland, see how you come up with your own unique approaches. And um, I hope these videos have helped give you some direction on how to do that. Um, until our conferences, I will see you soon.